Welcome everyone. I'm Aflaim Katsir, Sephardic Heritage International in DC or Shin DC, is delighted to host Rachel Villeli Glazer's three-part series, The Jews of Greece, From Antiquity to the Present with the Embassy of Greece to the USA and the Embassy of Israel to the US. We would like to acknowledge some of our members, Shin partners, Rose and Robert Capon, who dedicate this program in loving memory of, of Daniel Capon and Sophie Sassbon Capon, Aleem HaShalom. We also recognize the Valeli and Glazer families who dedicate this program in loving memory of Emmanuel and Emily Valeli, Aleem HaShalom. Today's webinar, Customs and Rituals of Greek Jews, a celebration of family, holidays, and culture will also feature Spiros Pilios Koliavasilis presenting some music. Now to kick off today's program, we call on Marcia Haddad Ekonomopoulos, Museum Director of Keila Kedosha Yanina to make opening remarks. Thank you, Efrem. Um, I'm really honored to be asked to do this. It's a pleasure. Um, I am honored to be introducing Rachel, who's a very, very special person from a very special family who I've been honored to get to know better over the course of the years. I'm just gonna give a very brief introduction. Uh, Rachel will be filling you in on the traditions and the customs, just placing Yanira as really the heart of Roman Yo jewelry for many centuries. And the location being on the other side of the Pindos mountain range, really secluding them from most of the other especially Sephardic communities in Greece, led to a very insular world where they developed their distinct language, their distinct culture, and um, certain, certain traditions that really weren't known anyplace else. We happen to have one of the largest collections of Shadayot, which are not amulets. They're really, um, they would hang on the parochid or on the cloth around the teak with the Torah scroll. And they were you know, loved in, love, in loving memory of my mother, um, in honor of my father. They were very distinct, made out of silver. And we have a large collection of those. We also have a large collection of books in Judeo-Greco, um, which one of these days when we're back in business again and you can come visit us, one of the best collections in the world. In fact, even in, from Cambridge, they acquired the Geneza from Egypt but they had nothing in Judeo-Greco. So we were able to actually um, make copies of what we had to send to them there. The um, certain things they shared with other Jewish communities in Greece, certainly the traditions in food, where it might vary slightly from community to community, the traditions in the style of dress, and Yamna was very distinctive from other Roman Yale communities. And we've often thought, how did they, what did they adapt from? Did they adapt from the uh, local non-Jewish world, either Muslim or Christian? And the answer is neither. They really developed their own style of dressing. The only thing that they developed from the Ottoman Turkish world were these magnificent silver belts that were usually given as bridal gifts by the groom's family to the bride and by superstition not to be worn until after the first year of marriage. Uh, the Aleph, the birth amulet made for a boy, and I'm sure Rachel will be giving you more details on that. And these were very distinct. The only communities we found that had these were Yanina, the Greek-speaking community on the island of Corfu, Treviser, and Arta. So this little inclusive world of Roman Yo Jews, um, it was it was not generic. It was very specific for the child and the child's name, that of his father and that of his fa grandfather, were put on after the brick mill lab. I'm going to hand this over to Rachel. Rachel, it's an honor to be here with you. And Afram has told me to hang around at the end, although I'm sure Rachel will be able to field all the questions. I just have honored to be here and to listen to her speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, and uh, when we come to New York and visit your, the uh, Kahila Kadosha, it's, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Ephraim, and I want to thank the embassies of um, Israel and Greece for um, sponsoring this um, and supporting it. 
So uh, our topic tonight is on a lighter note. It's on the unique traditional Greek Jewish customs and rituals. And it will be um, generic, not to just the Romaniot and not to the Sephardim, although we'll mention both. Before I begin, I'd like to say that my remarks do not by any means cover all there is to know about Greek Jewish customs, which are tied to our long history, to different places of origin, and to various influences outside Judaism, be they Greek, Italian, Spanish, Byzantine, Turkish, or other countries of the Middle East. Some customs reflect the general society in which the Jews lived, and some have developed over the years. And some vary even by village, town, or family. Also, many of these customs may no longer be followed today, but it is important for us to appreciate what they were and how they can still shed insight into this unique Greek Jewish culture. Let's start with the traditional home and family. As with many cultures, tradition is to be revered as the center of family life. And the family is the institution that is to hand down the tradition to each new generation. In traditional Greek society, the family is regarded as a sacred institution. All family members were expected to give great respect toward the father as the head of the family, the mother as the mistress of the house, and the eldest brother who was given important responsibilities. Supreme respect was shown to grandparents who often lived with the family. The tradition being that the paternal grandparents would live with their oldest son and his family in their elder years. Children are taught behaviors that promote respect and humility before adults, such as kissing the hand of a grandparent, standing up when adults enter a room, and never sitting on the chair where a parent or grandparent usually sits. Male supremacy was a given, so much so that at mealtimes, mothers with daughters often assisting, served the men first before serving the females. Not so different from Fiddler on the Roof, the father was the provider and responsible for the religious training of his sons, while the mother's concerns were her domestic duties, running a Jewish home, and bringing up her daughters in the ways of Greek tradition. First and foremost, children are a blessing to be cherished. It was the hope that soon after the wedding, a new child would, would be brought into the family. During the months of pregnancy, the mother-to-be was pampered with great care and affection. The wearing of jewelry was thought to ward off evil. So the expectant mother never left the house unadorned with multiple pieces of jewelry. Traditionally, the birth of a male child was especially welcomed and celebrated with great joy because it meant that the family name would continue. Since traditional Greek practice was for the male children to take over the family business and to be responsible for the care of the parents in their older years, including bringing them to live in his home, a male child was definitely desired. And according to Jewish law, it is the male children who are obligated to say Kaddish for their deceased parents. Of course, female babies were also a blessing and brought great joy. But a little boy? Well, that was a real celebration. Plus, the more girls, the more dowries for the parents to pay in their marriage. Surely a daunting thought for fathers of little girls. And here I have to insert that when my father would be asked the question why they decided to move away from Greece, he would jokingly say, uh, I have three girls and one son. That means three dowries. And so I had to run away from that. Um, so as with Jews in all lands and, and as with Greek Christians as well, it is common, it was common in olden times for parents to begin thinking of proper matches for their children early, even betrothing children in their childhood years. 
A girl who was not married by age 20 was looked upon as already an old maid. Today, we are most likely to consider this age as too young. Every sacrifice would be made by parents to marry off their daughters into a good family and to a worthy man who would be able to provide well for the future wife and family. Often, a young woman would be matched with a man even 20 years older, as men tended to postpone their own marriages until after they worked to help raise money for their sister's dowries. The ancient Greek playwright Euripides wrote, it is highly wrong to join two young persons of the same age, for the strength of a man lasts longer while the beauty of the female body passes away more rapidly. I'm not sure how I feel about this. As late as the mid 20th century, parents often chose their children's mates, either, either through matchmakers or through relatives. It was preferable to marry within one's own clan and second and third cousins often married, thus keeping the financial assets within the family. But after the numbers of Jews dwindled after the Holocaust, marriages between different clans and between Sephardim and Romaniote became increasingly more acceptable. And sometimes marriage for love would also be accepted as long as the parents approved. Marrying off daughters was a great responsibility and burden with dowries paid by the parents of the bride, sometimes supplemented by cash and often including a house for the couple. The bride's trousseau included linens, furniture, Jewish ritual items, silver and household goods. In addition, there were gifts given to the future in-laws during the engagement period, such as embroidered textiles and to the groom-to-be, such as a gold ring and watch and a talit bag embroidered by the bride. The groom's family in turn showered the bride-to-be with gifts of jewelry and gold coins. In selecting the bride, the son's family gave the highest priority to the girl's purity and her skills as a housekeeper, in addition to the social status of her family in the community. In selection of the groom, the girl's family's primary consideration was for the boy's family's status and his ability to support a family. The social status of the girl's family determined the price of the dowry. The higher the status, the more elaborate the dowry. Dowries were often put on display a few days before the marriage to be officially evaluated and for people to admire with details and values noted on the ketubah or marriage contract. Long before the wedding, preparations were made for making the mattresses and quilts for the couple, the bride's traditional costume, or later her white dress. When the wedding date was set, the parents of, the, of both the bride and the groom made a sash from kerchiefs knotted together to be kept until the wedding day. This custom is known as knot magic because of the special mystical power of knots to impede the actions of the evil spirits who might try to prevent the marriage. On the eve before the wedding, with musicians leading the way, the dowry was delivered to the groom's parents and the bride went to the mikvah to prepare herself for spiritual cleansing in her transition from girl to wife. She was accompanied by female members of her family who gathered and were entertained by musicians, enjoyed sweets and celebrated the bride-to-be. It was also customary for the groom to send gifts to his bride for the mikvah ceremony, including a hand-woven towel, metal rinsing, bo rinsing bowls, decorated wooden clogs, an ivory comb and a hair wrap. It was arranged that upon leaving the mikvah, the bride would first see a little boy as an omen of giving birth to a son. The wedding was held at home or in the synagogue. In the villages and especially before the 20th century, the bride and groom often wore ceremonial costumes. 
The bride wore, jewel wore jewelry with gold coins as coins were attributed with magical qualities in addition to reflecting the bride's status. Most marriages took place during the first 15 days of a new Hebrew month when the new moon was in the process of growing fuller until it reaches full moon. Prior to the ceremony, the magic knot sashes were untied, symbolizing the removing of any impediment that would harm the marriage. With musical accompaniment, the bride's family gathered to escort the groom, while the groom's family escorted the bride amidst people throwing rice, candy, and coins, and little boys surrounding the bride as good omens for future sons. The ceremony was held under the chuppah, which was actually a talit held up by male friends or relatives of the couple. Often the talit was a special one, perhaps a grandfather's. The wedding feast included music, dances, and songs throughout the night, along with the traditional favors of sweet almond bonbonieres, representing good luck, fertility, and a sweet life. The wedding week was observed with much joy, feasting with friends, entertainment, and games. Finally, three or four days after the wedding, the ketubah would be signed by the rabbi after witnessing the bride's stained garment, attesting to her purity. The ketubah would be kept by the girl's parents for the duration of the marriage as protection for her in case any marital, marital issues should arise in the future. The ketubah was hand calligraphied by the rabbi or a scribe and included drawings of geometrical designs, clasped hands, flowers, birds, a gateway or arch, a star of David with God's protective name, Shaddai, and other enhancements. The traditional text outlined the bride's dowry, her duties to serve her husband, the groom's obligations to the bride, and the amounts due her in case of divorce or his untimely death. The prominent colors in the drawings were red, blue, and green, those being the colors with protective powers adopted from Ottoman culture. Greek Jews were influenced greatly by Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition that developed between the 14th and 16th centuries, especially among the Romaniot and Sephardic communities of the Mediterranean. Kabbalah refers to a system of esoteric and mystical teachings to explain the relationship between the eternal God and mortal humankind, and to discover hidden, pa hidden pattern, patterns and meanings in the Torah. It is believed that by studying Kabbalah, one can achieve a greater level of spirituality. Kabbalah attrib attributes special meaning to Hebrew letters and words, especially God's names. Through gematria, the process of discovering the numerical values of letters and words, one can find hidden messages in each word and thereby reach new levels of understanding. Greece was closely connected to Kabbalah as the family of the famous Kabbalist Shabbatai Tzvi came from, pa from Patras, my hometown, in the early 1600s and traveled through many Greek cities in the Ottoman Empire, especially Salonika. Kabbalah attracted many followers throughout the Mediterranean and beyond. Part of Kabbalistic thought includes rituals for protection against possible harm or the evil eye. Belief in the idea of an evil eye is widespread among many different cultures, including tribes in Australia, Africa, India, South America, and the, the Mediterranean, the Near East, and parts of Eastern Europe. The evil eye is thought of, is thought of as a malevolent look given to inflict harm suffering or bad luck upon the receiver, either out of jealousy or malice. Generally, any disease that had no obvious cause 
was attributed, attributed to the evil eye. In ancient Greece and Rome, the evil eye curse was considered especially threatening to one who had been praised or admired too much beyond what they deserved. Ancient thought portrayed the gods and goddesses as punishing those who had become too proud of their achievement by causing them harm through the evil eye. Their misfortune, a sickness or a mishap, would be a reminder that they are but mere mortals, undeserving of admiration reserved for the gods. The common practice of not boasting about our good fortune or giving too many compliments comes from this idea of not tempting the evil eye. Many cultures developed ways to ward off the evil eye curse, such as various talismans, amulets, special prayers, and symbolic rituals. Among Greek Jews, protective practices developed specifically around the care of babies, as the newborn are especially vulnerable, and particularly male babies during circumcision. Most of us are familiar with the custom of tying a red string to ward off evil spirits that might harm an individual. The Romaniote developed a unique birth amulet known as the Aleph, which was a small note, often beautifully calligraphied, written by a rabbi, a Torah scribe, or a learned man in honor of the birth of a baby boy. On this Aleph were written various names of God in mystical codes, biblical verses, along with the names of the child, his father and grandfather, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the date of his circumcision, the names of angels who would protect the baby, and other inscriptions or prayers. The Aleph would be given at the baby's Brit Milah and then hung over the crib for 40 days to protect him. This special Romanio document served as both a historical record for the family and a symbol of protection from the evil eye. This next slide shows the olive that was written for my father in 1911, along with another small inscription for health and well being. And his name is actually, uh, you can see that uh, on the last word in that little uh, piece of parchment. Similar to the olive was the Shiviti amulet, which included the first words of Psalm 16:8. God's holy name, a menorah image, words of Psalm 67, names of angels, biblical quotations, and blessings. Shiviti amulets were used for meditative purposes by focusing on God's name or for their protective qualities. Often, a Shiviti would be written as protection for the baby boy at his circumcision and would also include drawings of the instruments used in the ceremony. And here you could see scissors down there. This amulet was also regarded as protection from evil spirits from, for mothers and newborn infants that would be hung near the baby's crib. At the circumcision, it was customary for the baby to have amulet jewelry, such as gold coins, a star of David, or a pendant with God's protected name of Shaddai that was made especially for this occasion and sewn on his little hat or clothing. In addition, there was an array of other trinket amulets and some chose to hang these on the baby's crib, including a glass ornament in the shape of an eye, garlic, or a mezuzah, all of which served to ward off the evil eye. Jews of the Mediterranean and Middle East often used the Hamsa amulet, an open hand, sometimes with an eye shape in the middle. This too for good luck and for keeping away the evil eye. Because the open hand looks similar to the Hebrew letter Shin for Shaddai, it represents God's strong hand in leading the Jews out of Egypt and in protecting them. 
Many of us grew up wearing a Jewish star or Magen David necklace, which we called Shaddai, once again referring to God's protection. The use of the eye symbol is widespread and is meant to reflect the power of the evil eye look and thus reflect the harm away from the one for whom it was intended. The mezuzah on the doorpost of a Jewish home traditionally also has the letter Shin on the front, invoking God's protective name Shaddai to guard our home as the doorposts marks the transition from our homes to the potential dangers of the outside world. And let's not forget what many of us grew up with, the ultimate protection, spitting three times against the evil eye. Although I became a mother in America, one family member insisted on performing a ceremony to ward off the evil eye on our first time out of the house with our baby girl just four weeks old. I suppose that the fact that I had not followed the custom of waiting 40 days before leaving the house with my baby meant that I really needed the extra protection as I was reminded by a scolding relative. The ceremony went as follows. Several items were prepared on a plate, each of which was raised and passed over our baby while reciting a phrase in Greek as explanation. First, a raw egg for a full and a whole life. Second, a piece of charcoal whose dust was rubbed gently behind the baby's earlobe as a measure against the evil eye. Third, a piece of cotton on the baby's head so that she should grow to a ripe old age. Fourth, an iron nail against the baby's chin, symbolizing growing strong and healthy. Fifth, a sugar cube upon the lips so that our daughter's life would be sweet. Sixth, a walnut over the face for a complete and full life. In completion, wishes and blessings of Mazel Tov and good fortune were expressed all around sweets for refreshments and lots of symbolic spitting. We were given all the items used in the ceremony to take home, along with a plate of nuts and small cakes for an extra measure of good fortune. There is nothing particularly Jewish about this ritual, which probably became part of the Jewish world through interactions between Greeks and Jews, both of whom considered the evil eye as a serious force in our lives against which we must be protected. In America, in the late 20th century, I felt far removed from the world of the evil eye, not to mention my enlightened Ashkenazi husband, who probably thought this a colorful superstition, if not a bizarre one. But even though we may have engaged in this ceremony skeptically to humor the older generation, we certainly appreciated its intent and connection to tradition. Do Greek Jews today identify with such beliefs? I am sure not, but at times tradition trumps belief. While we're speaking of babies, the Greek Jewish custom for naming children is very different from the Ashkenazi one. Greek Jews as other Mediterranean Jews and non-Jews as well consider it very important to name the children after the grandparents, even if they are living. It is a great honor for grandparents to see their names handed down to grandchildren and to witness the continuity of the family. You can imagine the result in a family following this tradition. All the first cousins from the same grandparents end up having the same name. This of course can become rather confusing at family gatherings not to mention the difficulty of doing family research years later, as the names keep repeating from generation to generation. Now that's continuity. The synagogue was of course the center of Jewish communal life. When we look at the traditional synagogues of Greece, we notice a different construction than what we are used to seeing in America. Those synagogues following Romanio tradition are laid out east to west with the ark on the east wall and the bima opposite on the west wall. An 
aisle is left open between the ark and the bima, and seating for the men is on benches on the sides, on either side of the aisle. This was the style of my synagogue in Patras. Those following the Sephardic tradition also have the ark on the east wall, but the bima is centrally located, facing the ark. Of course, both these traditions follow the orthodox custom of the women sitting in a separate section from the men on a balcony or on the sides, often behind a latticed separation and with its own separate entrance. According to the Romanio tradition and in some Sephardic as well, the Torah scroll is kept in a wooden or, or silver cylindrical case called a teak. This type of Torah is read as it stands upright in its teak. The word coming from the Greek word thiki, meaning case. These wooden cases or tikim are often beautifully engraved or painted with Phoenician style decorations, embroidered velvet mantles, silver and other embellishments. The Torah breastplate, yad, crown and bells are placed over the case and on the wooden rollers. Tikim were often decorated for holidays with fresh flowers, grains, and greenery. Tikim from the island of Corfu were known for their extravagant embellishments and multiple silver ornaments. Some Sephardic Torahs are covered with beautiful cloth covers, as we are accustomed to seeing. These covers are intricately decorated in Ottoman motifs, such as flowers, trees, and vines. Greek Jews, especially the Romaniote, developed the unique custom of consecrating to the synagogue their own precious embroideries from home to be refashioned and used as Torah covers, Torah binders, podium covers, ark curtains, and other such uses. A family's rich textiles, such as Ottoman style prayer rugs with intricate designs parts of the festive garments or a wedding dress, embroidered bedspreads, silks and velvets with gold threads or other selected pieces of one's trousseau would be donated to the synagogue. A dedicatory inscription or plaque was made bearing the donor's name, the occasion and the date, along with the names of God known as Shaddayot, from the word Shaddai, God's protective name. Such offerings were thought to take pl the place of the sacrifices made in the ancient temple and were considered just as meaningful as prayer. And here you see lots of Shadayot hanging all around and the same here. The oldest Shadaya found dates from 1611 and the latest from 1970. Shadayot were usually donated on one of the holidays during the morning service with a sequence of prayers alluding to the sacrifices in the temple, as the dedications themselves were seen as sacrifices. The placement of such sacrificial silver plaques on and around the Holy Ark was reminiscent of the sacrificial blood that was originally sprinkled in the temple's Holy of Holies. Through their gifts, donors hoped to obtain forgiveness, bring healing to loved ones, express thanksgiving or repentance for sins, or gain redemption both in this world and the world to come. The dedications often used poetic language and citation from biblical verses. Some scholars see a connection between these Jewish practices and those of the Greek Orthodox Church where votive offerings are dedicated to an icon or to a holy place in the form of small metallic plaques with an image representing the subject of the plea or prayer. In turn, these church offerings were adaptations of ancient Greek pagan rites, which were used to involve animal sacrifices. The Romaniote assimilated such local customs and adapted them to their own beliefs, incorporating biblical verses and prayers in Hebrew. In this way, Judaism adapted to life in the diaspora while staying true to essential Jewish values. Holidays among Greek Jewish families are celebrated with as much extended family as is around, 
And as except, expected, there's always room for more. There are special foods associated with each holiday, with the most comp complex, complex being Pesach, of course. The festive table is filled with many different kinds of foods that are passed around, as you would see among Middle Eastern cultures. A simple three-course meal is definitely not in the vocabulary of any reputable Greek Jewish home. Since the destruction of the Second Temple, the center of Jewish life was transferred to the home with the sanctity of the home and family table replacing the sanctity of the temple altar, thus referring to the Jewish home as Mikdash Me'at, a little sanctuary. There have been two major influences on the development of the Greek Jewish cuisine, Jewish laws of Kashrut and the customs of people among whom the Jews, Jews have lived for over 2000 years, including Greek, including Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Persia, Arab, Spanish, and Ottoman. Today, Greek jewelry proudly claims a rich and diverse and most delicious culinary heritage from the most ancient of the islands of Rhodes and Crete 23 years ago to the present. Perhaps one of the most striking difference between the food cultures of the Balkans and Near East and that of Europe and the West involves the notion of a balanced meal. For Balkan and Near East populations, there's no such idea of a balanced three course meal. Rather, the table is set with all sorts of dishes all at the same time with a number of different dishes often reflecting the wealth of the household. And the more, the better. Cooked, stuffed and baked vegetables, salads, cheeses and breads are basic to the cuisine, as are various kinds of beans, chickpeas, lentils, rice and grains. Many dishes incorporate dried fruits, nuts and various herbs. Olives and pickled vegetables are standard condiments at meals and Turkish coffee is often served at the end of a festive meal, along with pastries such as baklava and others dipped in syrup of sugar or honey. How many of us grew up watching our grandmother or an older female relative reading the coffee grounds left at the bottom of the cups of Turkish coffee? Whether or not this fortune telling was taken seriously by everyone, we don't know, but it certainly provided hours of entertainment. Shabbat is the crown of the week, as it is the crown of creation. As such, the mitzvah of eating three complete meals during the day is taken seriously and includes special braided breads, hard boiled eggs, beef, lamb, and vegetable pies, and concludes with sweets of candied fruit and jams enough to share with the guests who will be sure to stop by after the end of Shabbat. There is great emphasis on eggs, long cooked and simmering for hours in onion skin water that has turned quite brown and permeate even the whites of the eggs. With their round shape and association with fertility, eggs have always had great symbolic significance and are a part of all holiday meals. Rosh Hashanah begins the new year with sweets unique to the Mediterranean, apples soaked with honey, quince and rose petals cooked in syrup, and pumpkin seeds, uh, pumpkin sweets, while the main course was often a whole fish for each person, with the head of the fish representing the head of the new year. Other foods symbolize a good year, such as pomegranates, figs, dates, and nuts. Another practice with which I grew up is sprinkling wheat seeds on a bed of wet cotton so the seeds will sprout as a symbol of our hopes for a productive and prosperous new year. On Hanukkah, oil is plentiful with fried fruits and sweets such as fried spinach and leek patties, fried dough or lukumadis drizzled with honey. Traditional Hanukkiot, of course, use oil. Following the standard blessings for the lighting, Psalm 30, Mizmor Shir Chanukat Habayit Le David, was also sung in remembrance of the dedication of the Temple of Old and the Maccabees' Bees victory and rededication. Purim is a most beloved holiday by Jewish children everywhere. 
From the first day of the month of Adar, Greek Jewish children would go out in the streets, making the rounds of Jewish homes and receiving sweets and small tin coins as gifts. Everyone was busy with plans for parties, masquerades, mimes, Megillah reading, costumes, and games, especially with dice. Sweets were baked in the shape of body parts and given the titles of Haman's ears, nose, eyes, teeth, and more. Purim, not Hanukkah, was the traditional day for giving gifts to children. Since Purim celebrates the survival of Persia's Jews from evil Haman's plans, there developed the custom of local Purims in communities that had also experienced a threat to their survival and had survived. These communities often wrote their own Megillah recording the event. This localized Purim celebration is known as Purim Katan or Minor Purim. Such a Megillah was written to mark the survival of the Jews of Crete, Chios, and Lepanto in the, ninth, in the 1500s when the Jews were saved from harm due to accusations of being disloyal during the war between Turkey and Venice. Now I will skip to Shavuot and save Pes Pesach for last. On Shavuot, the holiday in late spring, celebrating the giving of the Torah, Greek Jewish homes and synagogues were decorated with flowers, sheaves of wheat, of wheat and garlands, dishes of fresh spring vegetables, as well as fresh cheeses and milk products were prepared using the milk of the late spring sheep and goats, still feeding their young, and thus recalling the biblical description of Israel as the land of milk and honey. Special breads were baked with symbols on the breads representing the Torah, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and the Israelites' journey in the wilderness. Passover is the most joyously awaited feast of all with its many preparations that started at Purim. Houses had to be cleaned, utensils changed, matzah baked, and meals planned. Although the Haggadah contains the same text for all Jews, there are some unique Greek Seder customs. For this, I will focus more on my family's Romanio traditions from Patras, with my apologies to many others who uh, I might not mention because of time. A typical Greek Seder begins by passing the Seder plate or sometimes a basket around the table over the heads of all guests and accompanied by singing. The symbolic foods in the Seder basket are regarded as specially blessed, particularly the egg, which is saved for the oldest unmarried female in the family to eat on the following day in the hope that it will bring her good luck in finding her match during the coming year. Two different bitter herbs are used, usually endives and romaine lettuce, celery le leaves dipped in vinegar instead of parsley and salt water, and the chirosid is a thick mixture of dates, nuts, and wine, and sometimes raisins and other dried fruits. During the Dayenu song, Greek Jews, as well as others in the Near East, have fun nudging each other. Many use leeks or spring onions to hit one another while a Romanian tradition is to use our elbows. My father's oral tradition attributed this to merely trying to wake everyone up as the meal will be served soon. Elbow jabbing invites hilarious laughter from the youngest to the oldest. When the 10 plagues are recited by the leader, everyone looks away as the leader spills the 10 drops of wine or sometimes vinegar stemming for the, from the superstition of not wanting to tempt the evil eye upon ourselves by looking and gloating that we were spared the plagues while the Egyptians were not. The Seder meal begins with the standard onion skin, brown, hard boiled eggs with all the guests participating in a raucous egg cracking game until the last egg to remain uncracked is declared the winner. Adults and children alike are delighted. The meal continues with many dishes with distinctly Greek flavoring, egg, lemon, chicken soup with farfel, roasted chicken, roasted lamb or meat, roasted lemony potatoes, spinach, potato and leek patties, stuffed spinach with ground beef and rice, stuffed cabbage, stuffed tomatoes, 
peas, string beans, and artichoke. Did I mention rice and peas? Yes, Greek Jews, as well as most Sephardim, do eat rice and legumes during Pesach. Desserts are light and include fruit, an almond paste similar to marzipan, candied orange peels, and Passover sponge cake coated in honey. There are unique tunes to the Haggadah songs for Greek Sephardim using Spanish and Ladino, as well as Hebrew, and for Greek Romanio using Greek, sometimes Italian, as well as Hebrew. I truly miss my father's melodies, which we will never be able to perfect enough and which I fear will be forgotten. Today, our small Greek Jewish community of Baltimore still follows many of these customs. But as the years pass, the younger generation, all born in America and none married to Greek Jews are forgetting the ways of their grandparents. So my generation, the children of the immigrants, feels a special responsibility to keep doing as much as we can to continue the recipes and customs and to teach them to our children. Thanks to the work of organizations like Shin DC, the Kahila Kadosha Museum in New York, and new research about Greek jewelry, we can continue to celebrate our heritage. This brings us to the end of our journey with the Jews of Greece. We've covered a lot of information during the past three weeks. Today, there are about 4,500 to 5,000 Jews in Greece, 3,000 in Athens, 1,000 in Salonika, 350 in Larissa, and 600 or so scattered in other cities. But the trauma of the Holocaust still haunts the survivors and their descendants, as the large numbers of the dead overwhelm the small numbers of the living. Romanio and Sephardic cultures have come together worshiping in the same synagogues, sometimes with an Ashkenazi rabbi, and incorporating one another's customs. Much of tradition has been modified to match modern life. Women today in Greece are free to have careers and become professionals. The traditional roles for men and women have faded. And there are many positive steps that give sense to hope. The Jewish community in Athens is excited about their new young Rabbi Gabriel Negrin, who is expected to bring a feeling of renewal to all of Greek Jewry. And the Jews of Yanina look forward to the leadership of the city's first Jewish mayor. It is my hope that my proud and ancient Jewish culture will survive the challenges it faces as a small, often forgotten part of the Jewish diaspora. In the meantime, we continue to learn its history and discover new and profound stories that amaze us. I want to thank you for your interest. It has been such a pleasure for me to share this time with you. And as in good Jewish tradition, whenever we complete a course of study, we celebrate. So after, after uh, we conclude here, uh, we're gonna have some music led by our friend Spiros Koliavasilis. I want to say thank you again. We will take questions after the musical part. And um, just a few words about Spiros. Uh, he is a multi-instrumentalist. He's a musician, teacher, and director of the Mediterranean Music School here in the area. He specializes in Greek and Middle Eastern music. Tonight, he will give us a sample of some Ladino and some Romaniotico music. Uh, and we thank him for being here, and thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much for the honor. Uh, Dr. Rachel, it's a pleasure. Dr. Glasser, it's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, Frem, thank you for the honor to participate on this wonderful event. I am also Greek, not coming from Jewish uh, ancestors, but as Greeks, we always celebrate all the cultures that we had and we have in our uh, in our wonderful language. So today I'm going to play for you a Sephardic song. It's about a young lady that she was in Salonika. And uh, actually the song is called Primavera in Salonika, which means spring in uh, Salonik, in uh, Salonika, the Saloniki. And uh, actually she was an oud player, a female oud player, which is something unique back then 
uh, women uh, used to have a huge role in the music and the culture and the cultural events. Actually, there were a few really, really great virtuosos of music, uh, Jewish and Armenian and Greek ladies. So tonight for you, I'm going to play the Primavera and Saloniko. And then uh, the second part is going to be a song from uh, Ioannina, a Romaniotico song that is called Kina Glosa, which means go ahead, tongue and speak. Say the story of uh, Esther. Um, so this is the oud. I'm going to perform mm -hmm. today with the oud. And uh, I hope that you're going to like it. Βασιλιά 
So, Kina uh, Glossa, it's uh, the story of Esther. Yes. That was lovely. I hope that you liked it. That was uh, I would like to thank in Greece some friends that they, because it was very difficult to find this uh, song. Um, the first uh, video that, as far as I know, is from uh, Sakis Negrin, uh, an amazing musician in, uh, in Greece. And um, th I thank him personally, even I don't know him personally. Uh, because, uh, I mean, we ha I didn't have the, the, the honor to discuss with him um, about the subject, but only the fact that some people like him are doing a great job and they take from the box of time out uh, this repertoire, it's a big deal. Thank you again. Thank you for the honor. And uh, I wish you all to be healthy and safe. Thank you, friend. I'm going to say all my thank yous first and then we'll turn to the audience. Uh, for, for your questions. Um, and so I just want to, to say it's an absolute delight for Shin to host Rachel Vallali Glazer's three-part series, The Jews of Greece, From Antiquity to the Present with the Embassy of Greece to the USA and the Embassy of Israel to the US. As we honor the heritage of the Jews of Greece, we honor the memories of Emmanuel and Emily Vallali, Alehema Shalom, we also honor the memories of Daniel Capon and Sophie Sassbon Capon, Alehema Shalom. Thank you, Rachel, for an informative and enjoyable series. We're also appreciative for the opening remarks made by Minister Tami Ben Haim at the Embassy of Israel and Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, Ambassador of Greece to the US. The strong Greece-Israel relationship 
is very important to us. As Rachel has put it, her beloved countries. Thank you, Marcia Haddad Economopoulos, for your remarks tonight and for all the work Kayla Kedoshaya does for our communities. Thank you also, Spiros, for the beautiful music representing both the Sephardic, Ladino, and Romanio Greek Yevanic cultures of Greek Jews. Thank you also, Pinina, for the technical support, all the support, and thanks to all of you for joining over these past three weeks from all over the U.S. to Salonika and Australia. We now turn to you, the audience, for your questions. Oh, well, I just want to know. I got it. I, I just wanted to know what, where the Baltimore community is located. Uh, where the Baltimore Jewish community, you mean? Is that what you're asking? So it's a very small community, um, Greek, Jewish. Greek Jewish community here. Uh, all, all came around the 50s, sometime in the 50s. And um, most of the generation of the, the uh, older folk, the uh, immigrants, um, have passed. There's uh, just a couple remaining. And uh, then we have I, I as a child and all the children of those immigrants. So mostly there, it's in Northwest, uh, it's not in the city of Baltimore. It's not uh, in the same place as the Greek community uh, because the Greek community is centered around the church and uh, that life. And uh, as Jews, we had to choose where we were gonna go. So uh, if, although we're Greek, we're more centered in the Jewish areas uh, Jewish suburbs of Baltimore. And so they want to know, are there any Romanio Jewish day schools? <laughs> uh, in Greece. Uh, I, I'm assuming mm -hmm. you're talking in Greece. Yes. So Athens, uh, Salonika, and Larissa, which is the third uh, biggest Jewish city, um, all have Jewish day school elementary up to through the, the primary years. Um, and then those children go to high schools, um, regular high schools. So uh, those are the those are the three cities that have Jewish day school. Now they're not necessarily Romaniot; they're Jewish. So there's no difference between Romaniot and Sephardic now in terms of institutions, because there's not enough. No, no one can support. It's not a big society to support separate institutions. Uh, Lenore Naftali has a question. Did the Lenore. Baltimore community ever publish a cookbook? The Baltimore community uh, did not publish its own cookbook. There was a very, very, very small cookbook that uh, came out internally in my congregation because we had a whole week Shabbat uh, celebrating Greek Jewry, but there is no Baltimore Greek Jewish cookbook. So, so it's a cook. There are there are cookbooks, and those of you that are interested should make sure to contact Masha uh, at the Kahila Kadosha Museum uh, because they have they have cookbooks there. There is one main cookbook of the Jews. Can I Jews. add something to that? Sure. One second. Um, you know, Greece is going into lockdown. Our publisher, who is really a, a friend. Um, because I sold out of the last shipment in three hours, is sending additional four boxes and got it in just before the lockdown. I don't know when I'll be getting any more of these cookbooks, so if you're interested, get yourself a reserved one as soon as possible. Although my name doesn't indicate it, uh, I'm a descendant of a Greek uh, lady from Corfu, and I just want to say one word, uh, maybe more than one word. Avraisto, Ishikorach, Thank you. Thank you. Was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone asked, uh, mentioned in the chat that there was a tradition uh, for marriage to give a Megillah as a gift from the bride to the groom. That is true. That is that I, I didn't mention that, but yes, that was a an important tradition. There's someone named L who also has a question. I was the one that asked about the tradition of the Megillah Esther, but I was told it was from the husband to the wife after their first Purim together. What was the purpose of the Megillah gift? Well, I think the purpose of that is um, 
it was very common for families to have their own Megillah, not necessarily uh, to just depend on reading it in the synagogue. Um, so that was a an affordable, not like a Torah, it's not huge. And it was, a, a, you know, a Jewish ritual object that was um, part of the family, of the family, it was an important part. And also it showed the commitment to Jewish life. Um, and uh, I, I have a Megillah that was in my family. Unfortunately, it's lost its case. So it's just the Megillah now. Uh, and it was one of these that was an important gift, just like a talit bag, an embroidered talit bag. Was it given from the man to the woman or the woman to the man? I thought it was the woman to the man, but maybe it went both ways. I could research that a little bit more. It was given on the first put in that the couple celebrated. And uh, it, you know, I hear some people saying it was the groom that gave, groom's family that gave it, other people say the bride's family, but traditionally it was given on the first put in after their marriage. Yes. And my name is Louisa Gani. Mm -hmm. And I saw that there's another person here with Gani, and it's not a, a common name. Okay. From Yanina, Volos, and my mother was from Larissa, Sephardit. We're if related. I We're related, you. Louisa. <laughs> I'm, uh, my grandfather was Ghanese, and he was born in Arta. I don't know anything beyond that. I don't know where his, his father was born. I know they, they lived in Arta for a while because there's some evidence of my grand grandfather's business, but I don't know anything of that, that they left, my grandfather and his, all his siblings left Greece around 1906, 1905, 1906, and went to Egypt. And uh, that's where his kids were born. That's where I was born. And I've been trying for years to find out more about the Ghani name, but I haven't been able to find anything. I haven't been able to find anything beyond my grandfather. It uh, actually means garden in Hebrew, and it's found in a, a good number of Jewish uh, communities throughout Greece. Yeah, I just don't know where you know. There's some, there, there may have been some Italian background ancestry, but I don't know. <laughs> Sophia Amaro? Yes, hi. Yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, Isaac Levy, was from Chirlu in Turkey. And in 1917, he left Patras for the United States. So I was wondering what Patras was like. And well, Patras was, uh, it's, although it is the uh, third largest city, uh, it had a very small Jewish population even before um, the Holocaust, about 300. But it was a robust um, Jewish life. Uh, I wasn't around before the Holocaust to remember what life was like. But according to my parents, my mother especially, who t spoke about how, uh, you know, everybody knew everybody and they had wonderful uh, relations with the Greek, um, the non-Jewish Greeks, um, very good friends and very loyal friends. Um, a, a lot of the, um, the uh, jobs, the, the, the men worked in textiles a lot of them, mm -hmm. as my father had a store um, with fabrics. And uh, the women, uh, you know, were housekeepers. They worked in the, they didn't work outside of the home, of course, in those days. And uh, there were a lot of visits between people and uh, visiting people on, the Jews visited the Greek Orthodox on the name day, because the Greek Orthodox are named also, they have like a Greek name after a saint. They would visit them, it was like their birthday. And then the Greek Orthodox Jews would come to the Jewish homes and ask, you know, who are you named after in terms of a saint? So, uh, I mean, there was no such thing, but they would come and on the birthdays and, and wish them uh, well. Uh, it was a, a wonderful, pretty robust life. We had a synagogue, a functioning synagogue, rabbi, um, and so your father left early. So that, that would have been, that was what you said, 1917? Yes. So that was, so, so actually what happened, the Jews in Patras were expelled um, in the late uh, 1800s, late 1800s, expelled from Patras because of uh, being accused of being disloyal to the nation and uh, favoring Turkey. And then it was 
time when there was some uh, lots of riots against Jews, uh, not common in Greek, but it happened Greece, but it happened. And then early 1900s, they came back to Patras and uh, actually rebuilt the Jewish community. So I'm not sure where your father, grandfather was in terms of that. Um, Angela, if you got that off the ship manifest, all it meant is they left from the port of Patras. That was the major port of embarkation to the new world. Uh, my name is Linda Kinsberg. I grew up as Linda Baum living on Eldridge Street and my uh, grandmother, Molly Espinosa, used to take me to shul. So like an average kid, I would run around <clears throat> the Kahila Yanni in a shul, playing, having fun. As an adult, I married an Ashkenaz man, a wonderful man, and I became religious and putting it all together and seeing everything that you've done tonight, it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to hand down to our children to know that their, their, their heritage, I think my, my children would be considered one fourth Greek, maybe, yeah, for my half Greek and that my grandchildren would be one fourth Greek. But I also want us to remember, for me at least, I don't, can't say this for anyone else, that originally we all came from Israel and we have to <laughs> keep God in our lives and just remember that um, he blessed us with giving us a place like Greece and a place like America where we can flourish, but we have to remember where we originally came from. And thank oh. you so much. Thank you. Um, Ada Yahudit. Yes, hi, hi. So you mentioned that the Jewish day schools are uh, now in Athens. And I, a question that I'd asked, are they Sephardic at least? Because like, for example, in Boston, there used to, there was a pretty big deal when in the beginning, there were only schools for Ashkenazim. They didn't have uh, Sephardic schools, day schools for the children. Um, so do they, is, is it at least Sephardic, you know, the, yeah. the day in schools? Athens. Yeah, in Athens, they're not Ashkenazi schools. No, they're, they're Sephardi. I mean, they're Greek Jewish schools. And Greek Judaism now is mostly, I mean, there's not a whole lot of difference between Sephardic and Romanio anymore. Right, uh, they're right. They're kind of melded, but they're definitely Sephardic. They're not Ashkenazi. No, what I, I, yeah, sometimes Chabad comes to different cities and then they, right. they, there they is they're Chabad. Cool. That's what I meant. That's why there's I was asking. Chabad in Athens. I don't know how involved they are with the, school but i think the school is run by the athens jewish community uh, i see they might have they might have some some role um there as well and there is a day school in larissa uh primary day school and a day school in uh salonica as well um that there used to be a high school as well in athens um but it was not uh, there weren't enough students to support that. So I read recently that the high school, they did, they have a new plan. They're doing some kind of uh, generic cultural curriculum that is attracting also um, non-Jewish students okay. to the school and they're revitalizing it, which is interesting. Uh, hi, Marsha, I remember you had mentioned something about the fact that uh, the Romaniot uh, and the Sephardim, and you know, they, they didn't used to really interact. They didn't marry, they wouldn't marry amongst one another. So obviously I'm assuming now it's different. And when did that start to change? Um, yes. After the Holocaust maybe, or after the Shoah mm -hmm. or before or? It, it is different. Um, it actually started to change, well, for sure, after the Shoah. It's right. just the, the, there wasn't enough population there to support that kind of, uh -huh. uh, inter that kind of uh, isolation anymore. So right. everybody had to not come together and work together and uh, support one another. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, mixing now and, right, and it's right. okay. I mean, nobody's really upset about that because that's the way it is. What right. is more troublesome to Jewish people in Greece is that the uh, intermarriage rate. That was gonna be my next question yeah. actually. Yes, there is intermarriage. In many cases, um, children go to Israel to study as okay. well, you know, either you know college or even uh, high school years and find mates in Israel. And Jews, okay. generally they stay in Israel uh, rather than come back to stay in, the, uh, in Greece. Uh, okay. But you also have the tradition about the older son 
or the son taking care of the parents. So sometimes you have uh, that choice you have to make. You stay in Greece and then thereby maybe fall in love with a you know, non-Jewish uh, mate, uh, but you're with your parents. So, uh, I see. so there is, you know, the community is, tries to uh, help in this situation, but it's tough when you don't have a lot to choose from. Right. So that wouldn't, that, that wouldn't make, or, or it wouldn't help them make the decision for everyone to kind of leave and to go to Israel or to go to a different country because it's so, because they're so, I mean, they've been there for yeah. Right. Over a thousand, you know, to the two thousand years. Some have so. left. I mean, that's why the community is so small. Right. Right. Yeah. Rachel, uh, uh, as an update on Lattice, the Lattice had cut to close the Jewish school. They didn't have enough attendance, and they made the decision last year to close it. Uh, was that the one that had like fifteen students? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize they made that decision. Yeah. Too bad. That's correct. I have a question for Spiros. Um, so I say, thank you for um, doing um, Kina Glossa so beautiful, beautifully. My understanding is that Kina Glossa is, is in Yev Yevanik. And in ter terms of preparing that, and Kintra, what are some of the things that struck you in terms of differences with, let's say, modern Greek? Or also in comparison to Greek music more general? Well, I wouldn't say that it's... In Yovanik, it has elements of the local dialect, to put it this way, or some uh, lyrics. They have um, half. The, some some words are Greekalized, to put it this way, if I'm allowed the term. The mm -hmm. ending is in Greek, and uh, the theme is usually or in local dialect, probably um, Jewish um, uh, words. And uh, the other thing is that uh, dance, the music is pentatonic. Remember a frame, the sound that we, the, 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 the messages that we have, uh, that we had earlier about the pentatonic and it sounds a little bit like, uh, if I'm allowed the term, Asian or, uh, it's a pentatonic scale. Epiros, northern east, northern western Greece, uh, has a very characteristical, uh, element it has characteristic elements of harmony and uh, um, music. So you see that uh, it's something very, uh, very unique to put it this way. And by my perspective, as a musician of more than 23, 24 years and uh, learning this kind of repertoire, I think that uh, the reason I chose the oud is because. By my perspective, uh, I think the scale was microtonal. So I think that the dance, uh, you the dance, because probably this was a music that people used to dance. It wasn't a music just like you know, like opera or something like that, classical to put it this way. It was a it, th those were songs that people used to celebrate after their dinners, after on their social events, and uh, so on. So. I think that the elements of music are very closely related with the dance and we see there the Epiros element. The Epiros element. I wish, I wish with all my heart, because I'm really, really interested about this repertoire, to find more music, more recordings, ask your relatives, ask your, um, ask your I don't know, search on the your ancestors, uh, you know, uh, whatever you can find, the recordings, old discs, etc. So we can revive this music because it's something that is going to be lost. It's very uh, Are you familiar with Vasilis Kostas? I he, am, yes. Yes, he's, he's done a great deal with revival of Iperotiki music. And well, the periodical music, forgive me for interrupting you. There are hundreds of people that they are on this uh, domain. But with the Romagnot music, the Greek-speaking Jewish culture music, by my perspective, the only recording that I have found, it was from Sakis Negrin. And that means one and only thing, that is something that is dying. 
And it's a sad thing to lose such a wonderful, wonderful cultural diamond from our music. Now, the Sephardic music, uh, the Ladino music, is something that is much more wide and much more known. And there are so many people, actually, that they are uh, focused and play this repertoire. For the Romagnot music, I think it's a duty of all our Greek musicians, when I say Greek, I mean also the non-Jewish musicians. Uh, as I said, I think it's a duty for me as a Greek musician to do more research, find this repertoire, record it, or save it somehow, even if it's not 100% the way it used to be, because it's better to be like 80% close to the result instead of zero. And uh, it's a sad thing because I heard all the story and all the, the, the uh, I was very attentive to everything that, that you said. I think that if the Romagnol people here get united, do, the, do like a symposium or something, that we can all get together, see what materials you have, anything at all, even if there are lyrics, and do a research with other musicians and researchers worldwide. When I say worldwide, I mean in Bulgaria, in Turkey, people that they have emigrated because of the of the uh, many many reasons that you have mentioned before. Um, so I think it's it will be very sad to be lost. It will be very very sad to be lost. Are you familiar with the Maya Baha? Uh, no. I'll, okay. I once I can open the museum, I'm going to send you a recording of hers. Please, uh, I would love yeah. to. Thank you very much. The Phonoteca in Jerusalem has recordings made by Amnon Chiloa um, of Greek Jews from Yanina, particularly Anna Raphael and some others um, that were recorded in the 50s. Those were, very that's liturgical music, though. No, <laughs> Anna, sorry, Marcia. I, okay. I, I got copies of um, Laments and of Lullabies. Okay. There's, it's not okay. Uh, it's not like key. It's not popular music, but it's children's music. It it's not in the Can I just say something it's about in that? I'm, I'm really interested. Some, some of that some of that material that Annette's mentioning was issued on a folkways recording, yes. and you can get it on the Smithsonian Folkways site. Yes. You get it electronically, and you can download the PDF for free. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's most yeah. of that most of that is uh, liturgical on the uh, Smithsonian uh, liturgical mm -hmm. paraliturgical uh, life cycle related yeah yeah most of that as I mentioned if you have anything at all that we can save it it's going to be wonderful in sense of not for personal profit let's make mm -hmm. that clear we are talking about a, uh, about a national treasure here we are talking about something that we don't own it and we have the duty and the responsibility to share it with the next generation or anybody that he's interested or she interested to to learn it you know thank you Sparrow. anytime thank you be safe yeah so it's, please <laughs> let's mine these diamonds um, <laughs> yeah and we'll take one more question from beryl and we're having a great time. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's time to wrap up soon. Beryl? Okay, I hope you didn't cover this um, before I was able to join. I also got caught due to work obligations, but you were going through the holidays when I joined, and you mentioned how important Forum was. And I wanted to, uh, and you mentioned that some um, uh, Greek Jews celebrate it um, based on their own survival and I didn't know if you could just um, elaborate a little bit more if you haven't already. If you have another I, session of this, I will go back and watch it rather than bore everyone who's hearing something twice. But. Yeah, yeah. So um, Purim Katan is a, is a custom, and it's not just Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, communities, after having survived a threat of some sort, um, to show their um, joy at not being... Um, destroyed or not being uh, pillaged or killed, they would write their own Megillah, basically mm -hmm. telling the story. 
And that community will then celebrate that day as a Purim Katan, as a minor Purim for them. Um, so some of these little Megillas have survived. In Greece, there are three, I think, that, are, uh, that exist from those communities. I don't know exactly where the original one is uh, kept. You know, it's probably in some museum somewhere. Um, and all over Eastern Europe, communities did this also. We have, um, we have a copy, if I may say, of the Megillah that the Jews from Sicily brought to Yanina, which was a Purim Katan celebrating the saving of the Jews of Sicily. And we have one of the few copies in the world in our museum. Okay. Good reason to visit when we can. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have just a really quick question. I heard you uh, in Hebrew. We say uh, for uh, you know the uh, for what we make on Hanukkah. I heard you say something uh, Greek word. It's but you it said something with latkes, which is not lokomades. Uh, lokomades. Okay. Lokomades. So that's fried dough. Basically. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that's what you call also the levivot that you make for uh, for Hanukkah, not the fried dough. I meant the uh, oh levivot, the potato. Yes, but that's okay. If there, this is the only thing I know. Oh, okay, okay. That's okay. You, oh, didn't, you that. didn't make the uh, the prasino keftevis with leek. Yes, we do that as well. Okay, that's my favorite. Prasino keftevis and spanako keftevis. So the spinach, the leeks, the potatoes, everything, everything gets fried. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I wanted to mention something that I didn't go into only because um, it's just uh, take more time. But one of the things that I miss hearing from my parents, my mother especially, and my sister and I talked about this um, recently, is her, her little um, proverbs that would be little sayings like that that for a situation, there was always a, a saying that you could say um, that would be like a, a proverb or an adage. Uh, and uh, in the case of my family, some of them were a mixture of Italian and Greek and Hebrew all put together. Um, and I am uh, definitely forgetting them. And so I've made it a promise to myself that I'm gonna ask my siblings now uh, that we should all put our heads together and try to remember what they are, uh, what those are, and, and write them down any way we can and translate them um, so that we don't lose it so, so colorful, colorful language. Do you remember any? Uh, for instance, one, I, I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but when something was out of source or happened, and Regina, you can, that's my sister, you can correct me. My mother would always say, Disgraziato porca miseria. That's, that's Italian. And mm -hmm. then there was another one that she would say. That, that, I, I, uh, those words are not so good. They're not so good, <laughs> I know. But it's, yeah, sorry about that, if anybody really understands them. But the other one is um, when things went, when there was something troublesome. It was, Que zera del dio. So I finally figured it out that zera is tsarot in Hebrew. So it's trouble, tsara. And for years, I never, we never knew what they meant in, in actual words. So, uh, so one of these days, I'm going to compile them. You probably had a lot of Italian because of the coffeotti influence in your family. Sure, absolutely. I have a partial uh, glossa or gathering of coffeotti dialect that I'd be happy to share with you. Um, it was given to me by somebody many years ago because it's no longer a spoken language now, but it's I have it in, in written. I'll, I'll send it to you. Remind me, mm -hmm. nudge me. Yeah, well, that, that's that's great. Yeah, I would love a copy of that. Colokithia. Somebody wants to know about colokithia. Colokithopita. Colokithopita for uh, squash. Squash. Zucchini. 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 Or, well, zucchini okay. patty. Yeah. <laughs> or pie. Zucchini pie. Zucchini pie. I'm Zucchini. looking. I'm trying to look at this. Anyway, um, I'm going to look through the chat. So I, I actually wanted to get back uh, to some people from last week. 
Um, somebody had, uh, I wanted to thank people for adding your own family's experiences during the uh, Holocaust, which was uh, wonderful that um, you were able to do that. Uh, and also um, somebody had asked about Corfu and why Italian. So I was just gonna say that you know, Corfu was under uh, Italy, uh, Venetian control for a long time until about 1860s. So, uh, and also from the Roman empire. Um, but I do enjoy the chat, so I look at them, and um, I don't have your emails to address it. Um, so you can get my contact from um, from uh, um, Ephraim if you would like, and then we can be in contact. Right. Um, yeah. So a lot of information and leads and. Um, contacts to be made so um please email email info at shindc.org and um we'll we'll do our our best to put all of these leads and connections and you know all of your your feedback together i would like uh to say a few words um Ephraim, uh, would you like to discuss about the uh, uh choir that we were discussing would you like to say a few words or leave it as a surprise? Um, Let's leave it for the surprise. Yeah, we'll, we'll... <laughs> You're going to get a Greek choir together? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've definitely piqued their, um, their interest. So the important thing is to, um, to keep connected with what's coming up. Uh, and you'll, you'll get the this, this surprise. Uh, as I just it, throw as the it bait, you know. <laughs> as it develops, so so please do um, keep up with the emails. You know, I just want to say, in in closing, thank you so much, Spiros, to point for pointing out to us what treasure we have, and as you put it, diamonds, and really encouraging us and and working with us to to keep mining for for all you know all these diamonds. Um, Rachel, you're one of our diamonds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for, you know, for doing this series. And, you know, each thing that we do is something to build on. So we look forward to working with all of you going forward. So please thank remain you. connected. And thank you, Efrain, for all the programs you've been putting together. Over thank the, you. Over the months. Thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you for attending. It was a delight. And Marsha, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You are welcome. Hi, Esther. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> How are you? Hi, Eileen. Hi, Esther. Hello, How are you doing? Hi, how are you? It's so good to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure is. I haven't seen you in a while. It's a long Hi. time. Yeah. Uh, good job, Rachel. It was wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. This was a wonderful series, all three. Wow. Thank you, Thank you Rachel. Kalinikta. As I can tell you, the years, you know, people are saying, a lot of people agreed with me. How can you be Jewish? How can you be Jew? It's just something that uh, people don't recognize, that Jews are all over the world. This was wonderful. <laughs>